also to sort of equalize the room. Some of you may know a lot about blockchain. You might have read my book. Some of you might not know anything, and so I just don't want there to be any stupid questions or to feel like anything doesn't belong. So um, not only am I going to talk about blockchain, but kind of how I got here and the thinking that went into my approach and what I'm excited about in the blockchain space. So um, so far, they've probably told you that I was I'm a speaker and author. Of, I'm a blockchain advisor to several companies, and I'm the founder of Rise Housing. Um, but I'm also a serial entrepreneur and a social impact enthusiast, and that came out of sort of having um, a different way of looking at my last businesses and realizing that not only did I want to make money, but I needed a sense of meaning to get out of bed in the morning. That just didn't, it didn't propel me out of bed happily to just be like, I've, I've got to get that P&L going better. You know, I, I really needed to do something that I could see an ROI that was intangible, usually in terms of helping people who were not related to me and whose names I didn't know. Those are the, tended to be the, the criteria that made me happy. So um, the other part that's not really usually mentioned is that I was an artist for 20 years, and um, I don't usually add artist into entrepreneur unless it's in my last business specifically because people really think of the two as very different, but I don't. I now see them as uh, very similar, like there's a continuum of thinking um, between the creator and the consumer. Some people fall really heavily on the creator side, some people fall on the consumer side. And on the consumer side, like when I talk to my cousins, they say, you know, what's exciting to you? And I say, what's exciting to you? And we catch up over Thanksgiving. And they're usually like, this new Jeep is available and it's amazing and it's got these features and we, we want to get it. And that's making them excited to go and get it. And they ask me and I'm like, oh, there's this thing I thought of that I can smash it together with this other thing and I'm going to go make it. And they think that's just as weird as I think their consumerism is. And we all kind of do different pieces of that, but I realize that artists and entrepreneurs tend to fall on the creator side of things, so it's not so um, so different. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about my background and how I got here. Um, my last company was when I was a working artist in the Northwest. I was in Seattle for a long time. I was doing public art that was uh, site-specific, uh, using light and glass and sound, and um, trying to find ways of making art that wasn't object-oriented, meaning that if you took a piece of it, you didn't get it. it wasn't, that wasn't where the art was. The art was in the entire experience. So you took a lot of pieces and put them together to make an experience that would have meaning or have utility, but was actually unsealable because you couldn't grab it and keep it. Um, I like the idea of making something that actually, it required someone's being involved in seeing it and experiencing it for it to have any meaning. So in that time, I also was investing in real estate and I had an apartment building in New Mexico and I got really tired of the rain. So I went down to New Mexico and turned my apartment building into an artist retreat center and residency program for artists and writers. And the residency world is sort of like the, the vacation model for artists. So a non-artist is like, just let me get away from work and go and chill out on the beach and, and read a book and forget about what I do every day. And an artist is like, well, let me get away from my day job and get into the studio and maybe sit on a beach or maybe sit somewhere nice and then get into the studio and do this work that I wanted to do the whole time, which is making art. So the residency model sort of fills those that need for artists. It's a place to get away to, to be among like-minded people and make work. So in the process of making that, I discovered this book, Building Social Business, and um, I was hooked. It was finally a way to give some structure to the type of businesses that I wanted to make, ones that had um, specific metrics around the meaning and the other ROIs that you were looking for. Like where was your actual return on investment? And how are you even tracking that? So beyond just your double bottom, your bottom line, it's now called sometimes triple bottom line or your quadruple bottom line, but they're looking at other metrics that you want to hold accountable for yourself as a CEO and also your company as a culture to, to really perform towards. And so we, that was what kind of helped me put together a, a robust financial aid program and really start thinking about tracking other metrics of success. So even though we weren't a part of it, of, of say an artist, experience at the time, once they had been through all of our programs, they would sometimes be launched into the MoMA, or they would have a show at the Guggenheim, or they would be collected by top collectors here in New York. And that wasn't something that we saw money come back, but we saw that that credibility. So we started to like look at different data points and see how how just setting that on, that setting that somebody in motion could just be a way to still move back onto our own business. And in doing this, I just, um, I found one quote that I thought was really helpful um, to steer my business, and although it was a bit too altruistic. So one kind of business, the objective is to maximize profits for the owners with little or no consideration for others. The other kind of business is the one, the selfless part of human nature. It's called the name social business. This is what our economic theory has been lacking. And this 
one's really, really way too soft and nice to sound sustainable. And what I found was using this as a guiding principle, I was actually able to make a more sustainable business by leading with the sense of having a, a multifaceted P&L in the end, and a multifaceted bottom line. People really were attracted to it. It attracted people that wanted to help us, that wanted to work for free sometimes, that had other capital that they were giving us beyond just money. And then it also increased our brand. We got brand awareness as a social impact arts business. And we were able to capture some of the best and then we were able, able to like raise our rates to some of the highest rates in the industry simply because we had such a multifaceted message. So there's something that's not really being tracked here in resources. And um, blockchain is something that is, it really helped me to give some metrics on tracking that as well. But um, the background for me has been always social business. So this is my business for the last uh, eight years. I ran it, I sold it about a year and a half ago. Um, it's called Joy Night Retreat, and we always called it a social impact company. So in the arts world, things have to be nonprofit for them to have legitimacy. So we kind of tried to bridge this conversation between what is sustainable and what is mission driven, and why can't those the two things actually work in greater alignment than in conflict. Um, here's just a picture of our art studio. And then fast forward, that gave me like the tools that I needed to make uh, Rise Housing, which is also a social impact company. And to make Rise Housing, that was something that, that kind of came out of a lot of thinking around how to make this something sustainable, but also what is impact and how far who are you trying to impact. So I realized I wanted to affect the lives of working people that weren't necessarily artists. They weren't necessarily on the creator side of the consumer creative spectrum. They were just working people that, that didn't really have an entry point into a marketplace. And when I looked at how I had sometimes, even though I invested in properties, I sometimes couldn't get into certain great markets that I couldn't afford. And I just kept thinking, how can we break this down and make things more accessible? So <coughs> my background in that department, outside of being an artist, was um, starting companies, uh, working in real estate, um, also bringing quite a bit of donation and um, economics, uh, economic activity to some of the poorest regions in the US, and also remaining a tenant sometimes. So owning properties I didn't necessarily live in and still knowing the tenant side of the relationship. So, <coughs> so about, years ago I thought of Rise Housing before blockchain existed and I didn't know that blockchain was needed I didn't know what it was it didn't it wasn't around in 2003 but I was living in that building full of artists and um, wonderful other artists and also prostitutes and drug addicts but mostly artists it was really bohemian life at its best and um, I was working on a painting in my in my studio and I was always hearing about um, how we were, might lose our leases, or who has the longest lease, because the Dillers, it's funny that we're in the Diller room. This is called the Diller um, Hotel, it became Diller Apartments. The Dillers were always just about to sell the building. And so we knew that they wanted to sell it, but it was kind of historical. You can see these skyscrapers going up around it. We, they didn't really want to see it torn down. Their great great grandpa had, had built it. We loved the building. We would love to have bought the building. Lending was not going to work for us. There was no way we were going to get 20% of whatever that building was worth. And there was no way we were going to qualify for lending. And also, there were like so many of us. How would we ever do that? Lending was not the vehicle to do that. So I'm in my kitchen, working on a painting over here. And then I would cut up brown paper bags and tape them to the kitchen wall. And I would draw out just like visual, visual schematics of what is this relationship to, uh, between the landlords and us and how if we were to buy it, but they're on top, but it's a triangle. But, the, but what if it's a circle? How could we become the owners but stay the tenants? How could we do this? And I kind of figured it out, but I had no idea what the process should be until I asked my friend John Kilteca. He was a University of Florida painting um, professor for many years. He lived down the hall. You, at this building, you really didn't need to get an investment at all because you could just like have, go talk to your neighbors and save a lot of money and have the same insight. So I go and I go to John, but I say, listen, this painting's not working. I can't seem to get it to work. It seems so weird. And I'm just stuck on it. Come over, I'll give you a beer, and just uh, we'll have a crit. But he's not really like that. He's not that serious of a guy. He's actually a much less serious guy. He's more like this. He's like a party guy. He's a super fun, he's, he's an artist, right? So uh, he's not afraid to grab an anatomically correct sock monkey that has been made out of um, sweaters that were brought by the thrift store and come over and tell you some wacky idea on how to get past you know, your block. So he's like hanging out, drinking a beer, looking at my painting. And it's a realistic painting. It's not like some abstract Pollock painting. It's a pretty realistic painting. And he's like, 
you ever turned it upside down? And I was like, this is why art school is stupid. Are you kidding me? Really? It's a real, it has a horizon line, John. Like, you don't just turn it upside down. Except I decided, okay, I'll go ahead and turn it upside down. And it started to work. The painting, this is not the actual painting, but it's just, it, it was just like seeing it from another angle made sense where the light wasn't working, where the composition didn't work, where I needed to shift it, so I needed to get darker, lighter, different tone. And then suddenly I made a few edits, I turned it back around and I could continue the painting. And I realized when you don't know what to do with a problem, turn it upside down. So I did the same when I was, I'm doing the painting now and it works. And on the same side I'm like, but this schematic of like owning this building doesn't work. So I was like, I should turn that upside down and turn that upside down and turn that upside down until I finally figured out that that's what we had to do to be able to make a building sellable in pieces while somebody can maintain their tenant's rights. And we, we didn't have to go get lending. We could just buy small pieces and just add a premium to our rent and slowly over time accumulate enough to either qualify with 20% down to get lending or they would just only need to sell 20% of it. Maybe they didn't need to sell all 100%. They could sell part of it and not have to go and get a home equity line of credit. So those things started to make sense to me. Now with this vehicle that I made up, we would have a way to, to work together, the perfect amount of buyers and the perfect owner. But then I thought, I'm a painter, I don't have an MBA. Somebody with an MBA has, has got to go do this, most likely. Because in the logic of artists, uh, if you don't make a painting, you are gonna see that painting in a gallery, like no matter what. It will, you'll, have, you'll see it, you'll be like, that's the painting I didn't make, ah. But somebody else went and did it, because ideas are not, not special, you're just, either you're lazy or you got the idea. And the same would go for on the logic of artists, that would go for the logic of business. If you think of a business idea and you don't do it, someone's gonna do it. So I thought, great, I'll just focus on the paintings. Someone's gonna make this and I can't wait to be a consumer of that cool thing. But that was in 2003 and it was before blockchain, so I didn't really know that there was gonna be a long, long wait. Um, I kept throwing this idea of the Rise Marketplace out to people for a very long time. About 10 years I was talking to real estate people and they would say, that, that, I don't know, that just sounds so complicated. A bunch of, bunch of owners, who would own what, who, who's in charge? And I was like, no, it really is simple. And then I thought, maybe I'm talking to the wrong people. It's not a real estate problem, it's a tech problem. Maybe there's just a technology that would make this easy. So I started digging into financial technology and crowds, crowdfunding had happened by then, a little bit, Kickstarter was kind of in the mix. And so by about 12 years after I first thought of it, it was maybe what, five years ago, four years ago, I realized, oh, blockchain is, that's what I need to be doing. So I started learning about blockchain and seeing that that was the technology that would take, like ride sharing was complicated until there was an app for that. And you know, fractional ownership is gonna be as complicated until there's an app for that. And so I realized that the technology was what I needed to focus on because I thought about the way that it would work in the marketplace. So this is where I came up with a more formalized version of Zillow's E-Trade, essentially. So it allows people to not only use lending as their way of, of extracting their equity out of their investments. So rather than having to go back and get, if you're a seller or if you're an owner of something, to get the home equity line of credit that says, I need to pull a million dollars out of my $10 million building, well, that's gonna mess up your debt to income and, and ratios and all kinds of other things. If you have a very diversified portfolio, it can mess up your LTV or whatever on lots of things. But if you just go and sell part of the equity itself, it's a very different story. So on a fractionalized platform like ours, you can take, we can just securitize the equity itself, either if there's debt on it in second position or if there's no debt on it in first position. Hold the title in a custodial agreement so that we're entitled to be able to sell shares of this. And it's an entity that's just backed by the actual real estate. Then you can bring in smaller investors and you can liquidate. So someone who wants to get that money out of that building can do so by just coming in and, and securitizing and fractionalizing parts of it. By doing this, they can actually save up to 77% of their closing costs. Now when you say make a $10 million purchase, because as you do, you know, like on a Tuesday as we all should have done. Um, but if you look at it, you end up paying around six, six to seven percent in fees between closing costs to agents, to title insurance, uh, closing fees or origination of loans. Everybody always assumes there's lending in the mix. And this doesn't mean there isn't, but when, in a case where you're just going to straight uh, do it on our platform, we only charge 2%. And to a partner that takes us to scale quickly, we need to cut that down even further. So for example, it can be one and a half to 2%. It's a much, much cheaper way to liquidate your, your and sell your uh, real estate. It's much, much cheaper to buy as well. So in, it, we're, call, it's, we're calling it disintermediating. And it is, there are a lot of players in the real estate space that are seeing technology encroach upon 
you know, the services that they're providing. And we have a plan for, uh, for bringing them in and giving them actually a new, a new place in that ecosystem so we're not just displacing people as, as technology is doing in so many industries, but we're actually re, refolding them in in a new way. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so like I said, the seller doesn't have to sell 100% in this scenario. They can sell a, a portion of it and be able to liquidate that, take that money, do something else with it, and then they just happen to be a, a partial owner at that point, and our platform enables that. We've currently got a pipeline. Um, I, I realized since, uh, how do I put this? The thing I do, I, I'm good at, is talking to people and building, building buzz, building interest, building a pipeline, building the relationships. So I went to all of the real estate developers that I had met and all of the uh, real estate brokerages and I just said, you know, here's what I think this, here's what we can offer you and if you have anything that you would like to tokenize, if you have any um, any partners that would like to tokenize, please have them sign this non-binding LOI. We'd just like to see how many of these we can get and over about six weeks I, I was able to get $850 million in real estate pledged that wants to come on our platform and be tokenized, meaning fractionalized and sold in pieces so that they, the money can be gathered up. Um, those are our partners, and I also have just been talking with a couple of states, places where I just happen to have friends in the municipal, either the state congressman's office or the senator's office, and there's been great interest there too. It just so turns out that states, almost every state is really having a hard time at a state level with revenues from traditional uh, taxation models because of the shifting, because of the shifting um, landscape of, of just work and how they're able to tax things, things like from the service-based industry, the products and, and, not, and whatnot. So because of that, they're hoping to leverage their seized assets in a new way with more public and private partnerships and fractionalizing could give them a vehicle to do that rather than having to, for example, auction off their seized assets to a private entity that then is able to rehab them and sell them and, ca and capture all of that value, they could partner with them and actually keep a stake in that and be able to bring revenue back to the state and maybe even resell it again to the people that are local community constituents and stakeholders. So there's a lot of opportunity for community involvement, which is for me the near and dear part to my heart because I'm, I'm coming from a social impact place at every time. I'm not against making sure that liquidity is cheap for people that have lots of money and that's their biggest problem, but I think there are bigger problems to be solved and that has to do with equity access and getting more small um, increment investors involved in big deals that are very stable, that have made great returns for rich people and they should be able to get a great return on their small investment as well. So the millennial market is really where we're focusing. Um, the millennial market, because of their transients, how burdened they are with debt, how debt, there are no more debt vehicles for them at this point, um, in the sense that they've overburdened themselves with student loan debt and now they don't easily qualify for mortgage debt. I remember coming through that crossroads myself and luckily I was out on my own supporting myself in high school, so I was thinking very economically about all of my decisions and I realized if I took on student loan debt, I would come out of school with a degree that I wasn't sure what it was gonna get me and I would have debt that would pre prevent me from being able to get a house that could actually definitely have an ROI if I rented out the rooms. So I opted for a different type of education, a cheaper education, just so that I would not have that debt to prevent me because I thought once I have a mortgage, it doesn't prevent me from getting student loan debt, but, the, but vice versa it does. You have to figure out which debt you're gonna get in what order. And a lot of millennials have not thought that through and they're now shackled with this debt that they, they can't, that now prevents them from getting more um, useful investments. So here's the part that has to do with the existing infrastructure of real estate um, agents and you know, trying to disrupt while also re-include. So there are a lot of people who are already have their, they make their money and they make their living in real estate and they, they, have, they perform services. So they're able to sell entire buildings on their own, right? So if you still have the whole hog buyer and the whole hog seller, great, that's not something to disrupt. I mean, eventually it may be. But really, it's, it's the innovative seller that wants to say, no, I'd like, I'd like to sell a portion of this rather than get a home equity line of credit. And we say, great, we'll bring you on. And then we have small buyers that go, well, I couldn't buy that whole building, but I see it's got a great return, so I want to throw $1,000 at it or $100 at it. Great, we can get you equity access. And we bring those two together. And that's a very different type of sale. It doesn't really infringe on the traditional sale model yet. And maybe after the market shifts dramatically, it will, but that's, that's far down the line. So really what we're looking at is how real estate agents have a feast or famine sort of sales cycle where they're doing really well, they've made a big sale, they're making nothing for four or six months and then another big sale. But if we can help st stabilize that without encroaching on their normal business, why not? So we wanna turn them into content creators and give them the chance to log on, be one of our registered agents or registered content creators. So it's 
whether they're an agent or just a social media influencer, they can now monetize their feed by giving, getting more eyeballs onto our properties. So come over, do a live stream, take beautiful pictures, do whatever you want with the building, put it out, and may the best content win. So it's also in, in tech terms, it's called distributed oracle. The oracle is sort of when you point to one thing and you say, that's the truth, that's the thing that we know, that's the key to this. So in the case of, say, listing a property, the oracle is the information about it. And in this visual sense, it's the, it's the visual content, it's the pictures of the video. Now, we could go and put a lot of money into going out and taking great pictures of everything, and we'll have to at some point in the beginning, but as this catches on, we're hoping that that oracle can be distributed, so make the best person with the best content win, and be rewarded by being monetized and getting a piece of our transaction fee for having brought the buyer in that clicks on their content and comes in and wants to buy a piece of that. So we're hoping to have a more robust conversation with the existing infrastructure of brokers and agents and social media influencers to say, you bring a lot of value. We want to harness your value. Um, this is just a slide that I made of um, what our platform looks like. Um, again, we want to make it Zillow meets E-Trade, so we want to make our in interface as much like Zillow as possible. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I was an artist, so steal like an artist, right? And you see it's already done well. Don't reinvent the wheel. And Airbnb and Zillow have done a great job of this. So we want to allow people to drill in to see properties uh, very specifically, and then when they get there, be able to purchase uh, by on-site. Um, and then here's just some information about the team. It's me, um, a wonderful uh, chief counsel. He's the head of fintech at Manad Law Firm. He's believed in me two years ago and said, and eh, for a small retainer, we'll just hold off on the rest. And I now owe him a lot of money. And he's been very, very generous, <laughs> generous and kind. And then Kelsey Kennedy has been in mortgage, um, mortgage and real estate for a long time. So he's now semi-retired. And I think everybody needs a good old white guy to be like, I don't know about this. At every meeting, and that's what he does. Austin Kennedy is kind of our Swiss Army knife. He knows everything there is to know about crypto. He's been in crypto actually for seven years, which is remarkable, seeing as though he's only 23. And Skyler McCarthy has been with me since my last company. She's always been my graphic designer and um, go to girl. We've got some major advisors. Um, one is in distressed MA and uh, distressed debt, and we'll see in the um, bankruptcy section. The next guy is Stephen King, is the uh, co founder of Ingrex. Was the first person to say, just go for it. This is a great idea because he's disrupting real estate in the MLS system. And Adrian Ashley is the person who's behind our social media marketing influencer stuff. Uh, she has a background in Hollywood and sex tech. She's a very, she's a, she's a firecracker. She belongs in front of a camera. And um, Miles Clark is sort of our toehold into the European market. Um, he is now a CBR in Ireland, but he, I met him because he was doing innovative lending for social impact purposes as well, not using blockchain. And when I saw him doing that so well in Ireland, I was like, I'll be right back. You, you work out the debt stuff. I'm going to go do this equity play. We can talk later. And he was like, perfect. So we've been like kind of moving, moving our, um, towards each other in this, in this case. But now that he's with CBRE, he's got a lot more to move. So um, I'm the agile one that's, that's still in the startup space. And I think that's everything. That's, uh, that's all I have to say about Rise. I mean, the rest is really about blockchain itself. Because I don't really know anyone's background and how much you know about blockchain, how much you don't. And also, as you might have noticed, I didn't say a lot about blockchain because just like when the first wave of the internet came, TCP, IP, HTTP, who knows that stuff backwards and forwards? Has that prevented you from using Twitter? Is that preventing you from using email? Did you ever need to know that stuff unless you wanted to work in it? This is what blockchain should be doing. It needs to be in the background. It's like truffle. Like just a little, just a little tiny bit of flavor. Flavors the whole thing. That's all you need. And you don't even need to know how it's all made. It just needs to work well. It needs to work better than its alternative, which is what we had before. So email is better than stamps, and blockchain is better than centralized servers. <laughs> I guess that's where I can stop with that. Do you guys want to like share any questions or share your background and your knowledge about blockchain or what you're most curious about? I would love an introduction very briefly. I. I've already read your book, but I would love it if you could uh, just uh, give this sort of oh, sure. intro that you actually give in your book, um, because I thought it was genius and it just made me understand. Oh, yeah, so this is my book, Blockchain 101. It's very simple, it's very small, it's not supposed to intimidate you, that's why you can laugh at it. Um, <laughs> but I, I wrote this book because my cousins are all in Texas. They actually, their kids are like, why do you wanna live anywhere other than Texas? And I'm like, 
what a strange question. Your, your parents are not doing a good job with you. But anyway, they asked me, why would you want to live anywhere but Texas? And I think, well, why would you want to only live in Texas? But anyway, we always have these like these questions that just go back and forth to each other. So when they ask me, what are you doing? And I'm like, blockchain. Like, what is blockchain? It's, I mean, they love me enough to listen to me talk about it, but they, it never really computes. And so in my introduction, I talk about my cousin coming and saying, you know, what is what is this blockchain stuff? And I was like, you know how your wife is on Instagram? And she's like, I hate that. I'm like, OK, I know. But so she takes a picture of you in like that ridiculous hat, like the one you're wearing right now. Um, and and you, and you hate it, you can always just break into her phone and like delete it, right? Because you can get into this centralized place that that picture is held. And he's like, yeah, and that's why I know her password. And that's why we'll always know her password. I'm like, okay, I get it. But just imagine if Instagram is like, she puts everything on Instagram. And I was like, okay. But you can delete it from Instagram currently. What if you couldn't? What if once it was on Instagram, it couldn't be deleted? That's blockchain. And so he just looked at me and told me, you're adding to the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like basically blockchain is Instagram without the delete feature for PDFs and money and transactions and ledgers. So once all of your followers have seen it, you can't take it off. And even if you did try to take it off, the rest of your followers would say that person is that's fraud. That there was fraud right there. Someone just changed the, the block. The block that has that links together in a chain. The block is made when we all agree. We all upload that picture and see it. And then we go, yep, seen it. Then the block is made. And we keep making these blocks every piece of information. And so if you go in and you try to change even one piece of it, the rest, it's like social social proof, right? The rest of the, of the social, the 99% are going to be able to say that's wrong. And so it's, it's basically technology that imitates democracy and that gives an opportunity for democracy and enforcement <coughs> in a way they never had before <coughs> because it's not centralized. So if anybody tried to hack it, the system itself would not, would not sustain that. <coughs> It allows for a lot of um, agents to now operate directly to one another. So um, you can, in the first wave of the internet, it was this big revolution to say, you can now email with this, this no stamps needed free email to someone in you know Finland. And it was like, whoa, really? It's immediate? Oh, this is crazy, right? And then, I mean, dial up's not exactly immediate, but almost. Um, that was a big deal. Well, now in the second wave of the internet with blockchain, which you don't need to know, just like you didn't need to know TCP IP or HTTP and CSS. You don't have to know that stuff. But now, if with blockchain functioning and more and more of our systems, you'll be able to transact with that person directly and not through your bank and not through any other system, but directly and just as quickly as you could tweet to them. So the first wave of the internet was a wave of communication. The second one is the wave of finances and value. I guess that's the easiest way to put it. So every transaction that you, that, that happens at Rise Housing, like through your platform, yeah. is recorded in the blockchain, which is like this infinite ledger that is like housed in like thousands of different computers around the world. Yeah, basically. And that means that that transaction is public and therefore it cannot be erased. And Just like that picture of my cousin in a terrible house exactly. his wife went on Instagram. Exactly the same. Yes. Exactly. And then every and anybody can go, wait, what, what happened there? Let me just log in and see. Oh, it's right. Oh no, he looked bad. And you can just see it right there. So it's the same with, you know, I paid my rent on time. Um, I made that last payment on my mortgage. You know, no longer were you gonna need my, my godmother had she paid off her mortgage so early because she was so aggressive on the 30 year fixed mortgage that she paid it off in 13 years. And she just knew that they were gonna find some way to give her some additional fee. She was like, oh no. I went in there three payments before the last one, and I said, can I walk my last payment in? And they said, well, we have to process it through the processing center, and that's not on site. So then they said I had to mail it, and I was like, fine, but I'm gonna send it certified mail. And she said, and wouldn't you believe us, and it's certified mail, and what they send me the next month? A late fee. And I was like, but you had your certified mail receipt to prove it. And this was on the blockchain, she wouldn't have needed that, because every piece of mail on the blockchain is considered certified in that sense. That accountability is automatic. So tell us how you tokenize a property. So the way you tokenize a property is, right now there's nothing that stops all of us from buying a building together, right? It's just complicated, which is what everybody told me for 12 years. It's complicated, why would you do that? You don't know your neighbors that well. And I was like, but it's true. So how could you do this and not make it complicated? To tokenize a building, you need to turn it into a very simple security. It's a transaction that anybody can buy and sell, which is in finance terms, that's liquidity, right? It's that there's enough interest in people that would trade in that, that that would, that would move. So you, you basically take the, the entity itself, say it's a $10 million building, and 
and you put a, a, a company can also sell shares, right? You can, there are simple regulations that allow you to sell shares in a company. So you make a company that directly just reflects that building, and it's only is tied to that building. So the value of the company is the value of the building. If the building is assessed at 10 million, it's worth 10 million. If it's assessed at 10.1, it's worth 10.1. If it goes down to 9.8, it's worth 9.8. So all your shares are gonna go up and down just like they would at Apple or Amazon or anything else based on the, how this thing performs. And how does it perform? People pay their rent on time. There's no big floods, right? It doesn't get taken out by a tornado. Or um, um, it, the general area is appreciating and it appreciates with it. Or it depreciates because there's a, a bubble burst, right? So you can own a piece of this. And when you get a share in it, that's your, that's your token because we call it a token in blockchain terms, but it's really your fractional interest. It's your share in the building. And so we can make those shares easy for you to just purchase um, directly and you can know all about that building and know you own 10 shares in it or 100 shares uh, because the, those shares are represented as the company that's a special purpose vehicle that lays right over the, the building and then it, it gives you the ability to fractionalize it. So with that vehicle now, that would still be really, really complicated 10 years ago if I had gone up and like, hey, just you guys make a company and let me and my neighbors buy little shares of the company and they'd be like, we have to make bylaws and this is insane and what if you try to, you know, this, it's just too complicated. No, and then, then what if we want to really sell it? It's like, well, you are selling it. So you're not really selling it until you have a marketplace to sell, right? So you have to get enough groundswell. And the technology is what makes it easy. So once you place all of those contracts into a seamless technological feature that also reports to a blockchain that can't be fraudulent. So if I only bought two shares in the Diller apartment building back in 2003, and they just decided, like, you know, I just, I think we just we forgot what that is. We're just going to go ahead and sell the whole building. Sorry, we can't even reach Monica, and also she's just some artist, and she bought a couple shares, and that was a stupid idea we made, and let's just get rid of it. Well, a contract, legal contract, historically has only been as strong and as, as um, enforceable as my ability or anyone's ability to get a lawyer and afford a lawyer, that's the biggest part, a lawyer up and enforce that contract. So if he who can go to court wins, right, he who can stay in court the longest gets the better deal. It's not fair, the social impact part of me hates that, I'd like to solve for that, and blockchain does. Because in blockchain, there's a thing called smart contracts. 80% of law that is practiced in the United States is contract law. And I was just talking with an attorney who's opened up the blockchain and crypto side of her law firm um, because she's like, lawyers' jobs traditionally are going away. It might not be immediately, but they're going away because again, they're just, they're intermediators. They perform a service that could be, now we have the technology to, to systematize. So they need to find a new way to add value. And writing a good smart contract means that if I had bought those two shares in the Diller Apartments back then, there was a blockchain to enable that, there's no forgetting it, first of all, it's on the blockchain. So you don't have that title to go sell again and just blow me off and say, what are you gonna do, sue me? Because it's, uh, it's already on the blockchain, it's already enforced, and the contracts that it's written with are already immutable. So in, if you had bought those shares in that, um, in that building, and the owner, the the, the majority, majority the majority owner, owner yeah. uh, wanted to sell it. What? How would that transaction affect you? And like, what rights would you have over sale price, uh, so timing, etc.? If, if they had come onto our platform, if they if we did this today with our platform, they would be putting their title into a custodial agreement. They would they wouldn't have it any more than they would if the bank had it. But they would, but we would have it, so that, that would enable my company to be able to fractionalize and, and form that entity, fractionalize and sell on their behalf on our platform. So uh, by selling, they're no longer the owner; they're just they happen to own, say, nine tenths of it because they sold one tenth of it, and I bought some of that one tenth. Now, when they want to sell the rest, they can either open up another million or two or three, or or they can say we want to sell 100% of it. It's still going to have the same appraised value; it just means that more is available. So then they would just continue selling it on the platform. So when a building is brought to you, you take sort of ownership of it? We become the custodial um, vehicle for it. We don't take ownership of it. They, they put their, we, we make the company that goes over the part of their equity that enables us to re then resell that in small shares for them. And then they can only pay 2% to sell and we are able to save them a lot of money and they can liquidate without having to get any further lending um, to take that small piece and I think to maybe take all of it. They can put the entire thing on there. But I've noticed that, I mean, 
just to form this company, I sold my last apartment building, and it was in Seattle. Seattle was appreciating wildly. I was very sad to get out of the Seattle market two years ago. It made me very sad. But I had to, because I didn't have this platform to do that. I wish I had just been able to fractionalize and you know, take out half of my equity and leave the other half in, because that was a great investment. But I couldn't. I had to sell the whole thing. And soon you won't have to. So ultimately, people will be able to diversify their positions really broadly and specifically and exactly what they want to do it in. For example, if you feel strongly about affordable housing, but you know that affordable housing is only affordable because it's got less than market rate rent. But you don't mind, just like in investing in a caliber fund in the stock market, which is a socially responsible fund, you don't mind having a diminished return in an affordable housing building. If you want to do that, you can do that. Now you can just determine what you're going to do. Or you can say, I love luxury condos. That's not ruining the neighborhood. I think they're great. Let's get more of them on the Lower East Side immediately. So you can invest in those, right? So you can, you can decide exactly what type of investment fits your personal and your and, and your financial profile. So what about if, um, so say again that, you know, there's a majority owner that, you know, still owns like whatever. 60%. Yeah, right. exactly. And, you know, the building is kind of like falling apart. They, you know, liquidated. So they put some money in their pocket through selling that 40%. But now the building is like, you know, it's, it's falling apart, it needs a new roof, a new boiler, whatever, it needs investment. Like who makes that decision and uh, how, you know, how does it affect each of the owners? Yeah, the shareholders. So shareholders. again, you have to break this into its smallest pieces. It's no longer a centralized unit, right? Just like blockchain brings us decentralized ledgers, we have decentralized ownership. So we have to break this into who, has, who is doing governance and in what sort of way. So we don't take on a property that doesn't have a third party property management company. People call themselves real estate investors often when really they're sort of glorified plumbers of their own buildings, right? And they make their money by not having to hire other people to do a lot of work. And so they're the handyman and the, it's not an investment though. They're not hands off saying, that's my investment. We need, so we only do properties that have a third party that do the day to day. And then the investment itself is operating that way. Now, just like with any, if you were to own the entire building yourself and need a new roof, You've got to figure out how you're going to afford a new roof, right? Or, or get out of it and get out of it knowing that you need a new roof. So when that third party comes in and says, "Here's the inspection. This is what we need. This is the this is the current appraisal of this building," that's that's just a fact there. So all of the people that invested are now it, proportionally to how much they own are going to see that come back at either their diminished um, appreciation or if, if it goes down in value appreciating wise or it depreciates, or if it's gonna go down because they're gonna to have to liquidate some of the shares that they have, and some of that's gonna to have to depreciate, so they'll, they'll have to like take some of the money out of the pot to go and afford a new roof, and it'll be still relational to how much, how, what, what percentage that you own in that. So the person that owns 60% is taking on more risk than the person that owns 2%, but they're still gonna see a, a relational decrease in, in what, they're, what, what they're gonna be distributed to that year, because they're gonna to have to have put it back in. You're assuming that there's like a capex reserve that you know is like healthy, et cetera. Like what happens? No, I mean I'm not assuming isn't. that. I think a, a healthy reserve is something that we would want to make sure is there for any building that we would approve on the on the platform. Right. But if something okay. wants to go terribly wrong, and there's I mean there's insurance for many of these things, right? Sure. Yeah. So a lot of these, it's no it's no more catastrophic than if one person owned it alone. In fact, it's I less catastrophic because not one person has to shoulder the burden of it. Yeah. So the third party we, manager sort of managers to make sure that the the building is cash flow positive. Um, yes, well they're the ones that would be handling the rentals, all of that. So the, the property management company, like JLL is a perfect example. They're a strategic partner of ours and they are doing, their, their, their piece in the ecosystem is quite robust, but certain things they do very well, like property management and then fiduciary management. So they can then collect rents and then redistribute them to us so that we can redistribute them to the owners in the form of their, their cash on cash return. Because really there's two components to this particular share that you'd be buying, right? You're gonna buy a piece of real estate because you think it's it's Manhattan, you buy this building, it's gonna go up in value. My one dollar is gonna be worth a dollar three next year because it's appreciating at 3%. Cool, I'll take it. And it's a lot more real than like what's happening at Apple, I don't even know, I don't even like the new iPhone. So like you actually can track your own neighborhood more easily than you can track what's happening at Amazon, you know? So it's a little more concrete to the average investor, for starters. And then the other piece of what you would invest in is are all the tenants paying paying their rent on time? What's the occupancy rate? 
are people, are th these tenants good tenants? How is it maintained? I'd like to walk around the building. Is there a bunch of graffiti on it? Looks like the walls are nice. It looks like the tenants are stable. I see that there's not many empty empty places. I can see, you know, on the perform on the investment memorandum that tells me all the details of the building before I buy it. I buy a piece of it. How, what's the occupancy rate? Are any of these uh, rent controlled? That would also bring our uh, the return, internal rate of return down. <coughs> so you're going to get two things. You're going to have your appreciation from a dollar going up to a dollar three if it appreciates by three percent, and you're also going to get say a five percent or a three percent return. A cap rate is what people call it, but more more. Uh, clearly, it'd be called an IRR, an internal rate of return. But all the money that's in there functioning, how much comes out as that passive income that would normally just go to one landlord, now it gets distributed to all the people. And um, uh, would you at any point expect the contributors, the, sorry, the shareholders to contribute uh, capital to do any, like, repair work or, or maintenance work or anything like that? No, but in the clause in the in the agreement to purchase is that if there is if the what is it if the reserve is ever depleted, it, you are the owner you so do you do need be, to contribute. Yeah, yeah, you either need to contribute or we will be deleting we will be uh, diluting your shares and selling them proportionally across the board, not with any specific so that everybody's taking the risk together, but proportionally we'll be sharing those and selling those just to raise this capital to address those needs. And that may be at below what the amount was that you purchased it at, so you may lose on that. So that's part of why, you know, just like if you bought an apartment or a co-op or a condo, you want to make sure that it's a healthy building. So the same due diligence goes into that. Mm. So when you're saying that there's a lot of liquidity um, in it, like so, say you're uh, you're you know like a minority shareholder, like the way you provide that liquidity is if you wanted to sell your shares put it back sort of on the market and wait for someone to right. buy those shares. Exactly. And like give the, like maybe the majority owner or whoever an opportunity to buy. Sure. And also there's a messaging possibility. There's a messaging system. So if you want to say, hey, you guys, before I put this on the market, you know, I, I want to see if I can, I think it should be worth, it's a dollar seven a share right now. I kind of think it's worth a dollar eight. It'll come in at a dollar nine. We all know that it's been appreciating this much. I'd like to sell it at a dollar eight now. If you want to make an offer, that's great. If I don't get any offers by next Friday, I'm going to make it public at you know dollar eight. If I don't get a dollar eight, I guess I'll have to go to dollar seven. But let me know. You could also be like, oh my gosh, I bought this. I love it. It's right. It's like I walk past it every day. I can't believe I'm a part of the Empire State Building or whatever it is that you're excited about it. Just like you might get excited about a whole house. And some people pay above the you know appraised amount for a house. Well, it could happen. I'm, I'm just thinking my, my futurism cap is on a little bit. It could happen that people go, I was so excited about this, or I got some inside intel, or they're about to put a light rail station over here, or whatever, and I really want to buy more. And you can message those other owners and say, I'll offer you above appraised price if you'll sell me some. Will you? Because I kind of feel like I, I, know, I would want to do that, right? If you feel like falling in love with, this, with the place, you should be able to. But I think that to be SEC compliant, but also just to be forthright and honest, we have to make sure that we're very, very clear on what the appraised value is and what the clear market value is from as many different data points as possible. We've got a couple of AI partners that have done incredible visual digital, digital um, visualization of single family and multifamily homes throughout the entire US. And so you can go back to like 2003 and just like watch a video from 2003 through maybe 2012 and see how the, the you know, bubble burst in different places. And it literally looks like a hurricane. It, it looks like weather. When you watch like, you know, in this very poor center, things are still selling above market and above like average. And then and in the, like, it's usually the third ring out from the center, not the fourth, but the third is where it starts to fall. And then it goes from there and it literally comes in and looks like a hurricane. It's so interesting, and I was like, this looks like nature. And this totally geeky AI guy who was like programmed the whole thing, he was like, well, we are nature. And I was like, oh, right, this, I feel so stupid. So it's interesting to see our behaviors from this very meta level, but I also think that data is incredibly important to the individual investor. And if we can provide that, we're providing so many things above and beyond what the current marketplace gives the, the buyers and sellers in whole hog deals. Does um, each token have the same value in, in relation to like like a dollar value, or do you split each property in into a different number of tokens? That's a very good question. That I think we solved that when we looked at it through a perception lens, just a, just a psychology lens. Is it is it easy for me to imagine owning you know ten, one hundred?
remembrance of this building, or is it unique for me to imagine I own 50 bucks, or 500 bucks, or 500,000? So we just made every building that comes onto the platform get split into the same number of tokens as there are dollars. It goes down to a dollar amount. Right. And then those started at one dollar. All of them start with a one dollar valuation. Upon being appraised, that building appraised the following year, and eventually as we get more traction the following quarter, we'll have quarterly appraisals, we can see that potentially fluctuate. So it might be worth now a dollar and one cent. But everything will start at a dollar. It will also give people, at least early users, a good idea of, oh, okay, so this is a new product. It's only been on the, the platform for three years, and it's already trading at a dollar seven. Over three years, it's gone up 7%. Like, it's going to be easy to track that. So we thought that that's the easiest way to let consumers, con like, just consume the information. When uh, can we invest? Right now. Is open right now? Is functioning right now? We actually have our beta open. I can give a demo of that as well. Um, yeah, sure. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. I didn't come thinking you run that, but I'll do it. Um, yeah. Is it a USB? What? It's my computer. Oh, okay. Um, 